This session is the global ecological collapse happening now and the way forward. Michael, welcome. Thank you, Tom. Thank you all for being here. Um, in this session today, um, what I'd like to do is kind of go into some detail about the, what we're actually facing. If you haven't ever looked at the MIT climate study, uh, what you'd like to kind of rest this upon is the, actually the MIT climate study. Maybe it's my scientific background, but I like to lay out the evidence, the observational data to support a claim, and have you all just know what the facts are, because I believe confidently when people put their energy and effort into caring and listening to know what the facts are, and they understand what they are, I, I have faith in people's ability to respond. I don't play around with the whole budget. I just tell you what is going on. There's a link in there, a guy named Dan Miller, who was 2009, gave a talk called A Really Inconvenient Truth. <laughs> um, and he used to go around with Al Gore until he was fed up. If you'd like to um, look at that someday, you would, that's a great uh, lecture to check out. Also, another great lecture in that uh, packet of information it is James Hansen's TED Talk. It's about 17 minutes long. It's worth checking out. I'm going to talk a little bit about that information today. Actually, I already did that information about the, that the Earth's gaining 400,000 um, Hiroshima bombs worth of energy each day. You'll hear James Hansen say that in his TED Talk. Um, okay. So to start, what I'd like to do is I'd like to show you this brief video. This is um, Arctic sea ice, 1979 held fixed. And next to it, you're going to see it fluctuate as a function of time. Now, this is the volume of Arctic ice. And it's important to think about what the difference is between volume and surface area. Because when you see the picture from the satellite image, you're only seeing the surface area. And well, that paints one picture. But when you factor in the volume, it's a different picture. How many years do you think it will be until it's completely gone? You know, sometimes you start. It went up some years and it went down. But if you look at the overall trend, what's the overall trend? Yeah. Right. Um, corporations are applauding this because it's opening up new areas for drilling. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, talk about a psychopathic mindset, right? Um, and now this is a really big problem. This is what's called a biofeedback. <clears throat> what that means, what's a biofeedback, it's when humanity's kind of tipped the scales to such a point where now the Earth is accelerating the problem. Because with the ice gone, ice reflects solar radiation back into space. Dark water absorbs it. And it, here's the numbers. Ice reflects about 80-85% of solar radiation back into space. That nice white ice. Water absorbs 80-90% to 90 of solar radiation. So it has like an exponential effect on warming. That's why the Arctic region is one of the areas warming the fastest. <clears throat> the Arctic sea ice is in water. So like ice cubes in a glass, when it melts, it melts and you know, it is what it you know, doesn't contribute that much to you know sea level rise because it's already in the water. But now the Antarctic ice is not in the, your glass. It's extra ice, right? It's ice on land. And when that ice melts on land, the volume of Antarctica ice is going down too. The surface area is growing, but the volume is still going down. And you might say, okay, well, why is it expanding? 
If anyone out there remembers chemistry class, when you add salt to water, right, what happens to the freezing point? It goes what? It goes down. It goes down. So if you have a lot of fresh water that's melting, that's dumping into the, the uh, local shoreline, and that water, and it's doing what's called desalinating it, the melting point goes up. So it can freeze at a higher temperature. And so you have this thin layer of ice. And so from a satellite image, it appears that you know, it's, it's, the ice is growing. So it makes for a great talking point for places like the BBC and so forth to try to debunk global warming. I actually talk about this. If you ever wanted to um, hear a one hour thing, I gave this presentation on, uh, online. Um, it was a radio presentation after the People's Comp March. And if you just Google my name, Michael Ippolito, and then um, you know, uh, if you type move to amend, you'll see it'll come right up. It was a one hour presentation. I talk actually about that as well. <coughs> So, the MIT climate study, what does that look like by way of numbers? Our best shot, and it's a very, very, very low probability of this, is a 3.5 degree Celsius warming by 2100. That equals 6 degrees Fahrenheit. That is the best case scenario, and the odds of that are less than 1 in 10 when the study was done. But I have a story to tell you that's going to make this a lot worse. <laughs> the most probabilistic scenario when the MIT climate study was done was 5.2 degrees of warming Celsius. That equals 9 degrees of Fahrenheit. That's 61, the average temperature of the planet is 61 degrees. That would go up to 70 degrees. That is a very large jump. Right now, we're well over a degree since the Industrial Revolution, and could be close to two degrees by 2030. That's probably almost definite. And the worst case scenario that the MIT climate study pointed to was a 7.4 degree warming by 2100 that would be a 13 degree increase in warming. Um, just the first one that I mentioned, the six degree Fahrenheit, I mean, that's, you know, game over for <coughs> as like a species. <coughs> Big mammals aren't living on the planet. It might be like bacteria and rodents. But with that type of warming, our ability to grow food, like California, the Southwest, the new normal was a desert. That's the new normal. There's going to be massive problems that are happening with um, you know, them getting water, right? And you see like Ferguson and the social unrest there. Let me ask you, what do you think society is going to look like when food and water is not something that's so easy, where it's so easy to go to a grocery store and get because there's shortages? Now, we're insulated from that, being the empire. We're <coughs> insulated from that. But countries like Syria and Egypt weren't. And that's what fueled unrest. Like in Egypt, when they marched in <coughs> the streets, they were saying, we want democracy and bread. Because of alterations in climate, they weren't, their crops got destroyed. Okay? And this actually happened with cattle here in the United States. So a few years ago, cattle got wiped out because of the drought. And they couldn't feed. So they, the meat prices went down for a while because they just sold off all this cattle. So, you know, it's a very delicate system that we have. And that's why once we pass the We the People Amendment, then the real work begins to build local sustainable communities, have local food production, local energy production as best we can. These are some of the solutions. Things like aquaponics, it's a great, if you don't know what it is, Google it, it's outstanding. Fish and then dropping speed plants that grow, and then the plants feed the fish. It's a nice closed system, it's outstanding. We should have localized food production, <coughs> energy production right away with food banks.